Um, so yeah, guys, I'm Dilip Swami. I'm the CEO of Transform Air. And uh, what I'm going to do here today is walk you through a little bit of our product development process. Um, we've had a really wide and varied product development process because there's a lot of things going on, chemistry, physics, you know, some really fundamental research that, that, that we heard about, but also a lot of fast prototyping, hacking, trying to figure out and uh, you know, put the, putting things in front, in front of customers quickly. So we've done a lot of different things, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of those things that we've done, and hopefully, you know, no two products are the same in terms of their development, but hopefully we can get some general principles out of there that will be useful to everybody. Um, so, you know, the trend in product development is to go fast, as fast as possible, and going fast is really important. It's something that's been enabled by technology, but it's fundamentally driven by our need as startups trying to innovate. Um, but sometimes speed is not the most important part about going fast. Sometimes you need to take a different level of, you need to take a different level of rigor in your product development in order to, in the end, go faster, like have a faster end result. Um, a little bit about us, uh, Matt mentioned, we mentioned him at SolidCon, and uh, what we were presenting there was a technology that we've developed for, uh, technology that we've developed for indoor air purification. So what we've developed is a fundamentally a new way of approaching cleaning your air. Instead of you know, filters that try and trap things like dust in meshes, in physical meshes, what we do is we actually look at the chemical composition of what's in your air and try and break it down using a combination of light, electricity, and chemistry. And so I just want to give you that kind of that, that idea of a background so you understand some of the things that we, as we go through. Um, but I'm happy to answer any more questions on that topic. Um, just a little bit about my background. I'm the CEO, but my original background was in electrical engineering, applied physics. And so, uh, you know, this research is something that we've been doing for, I, I've been working on for, for a very long time. Uh, before we go through, I do want to acknowledge, I do want to talk a little bit about why fast is important. So we can talk about why sometimes the need for speed can break, actually break things down. But fast is really important because we as startups have limited time and limited resources. So we need to arrive to solutions very quickly. And in that process, we need to make sure that whatever assumptions that we have going through, we test them as soon as possible so we're not wasting time. Because time that you're, you're, you're spending on something that you haven't been able to test is wasted time. So, uh, so, so that's something that's fundamentally important. But there's sometimes when you need to take a step back in that process and look at what it is you're trying to do and whether there's a different level of rigor that you have to apply. And for us, where that process was, was in the research stage. So we spent a number of years researching this technology uh, in, in order to provide drastically cleaner air. And you know, what we looked at was the important thing for us was basically that this is our core fundamental value. This is what we're providing to the world, right? This is, this is, our, this is what we're going to sell on later and what we're going to verify. And so, you know, we can, there, there's a lot of things that can be done around the promise of clean air, but if we can't fundamentally deliver something that nobody else has been able to deliver until now, then we have a problem, right? Like you get your product out there, you verify it around your idea of clean air, and then people are experiencing something mediocre, right? So that's why what we did was we took a lot of time in the research phase. We took a little bit of a different approach. Um, you know, there's a lot of different approaches you can take to this, but the approach that we took was we basically bootstrapped through the whole research phase. We got federal grants, and we spent a lot of time. Uh, you know, when we did these tests, we did them hundreds of times, not just one time, right? There's a, you know, there's a lot of sometimes rush to get to a great proof of concept that looks great, but then sometimes what happens is later on, you know, you're out in manufacturing and you're, you're, you're out there trying to figure out fundamental things about your product. And that's a really expensive place to figure out those things and sometimes it can end up ta actually taking you longer. So we spent a long time here, we did hundreds of experiments and you know I can I can go into some more details if you want about about you know how to isolate what level of rigor you need at what spot but fundamentally you know when we're when we talk about our technology to 
to users, to investors, to whoever, we have a level of confidence because we've done this test in this graph hundreds of times under hundreds of different conditions. We know it works. And that's a level of peace of mind that you're, that you're really out there searching for when you're, when I'm, when you're talking about that rigor. Uh, so some, some of the other things that we did in order to go fast was we spent a lot of time researching the technology, but you know, our first embodiment of the technology, we literally just wrapped a box around it and tried to sell it to people. And we stuck it up and, and we, we basically cut open ducks and stuck them into ducks and uh, tried to learn that selling process, tried to see how people perceive that better air quality. And we quickly actually ended up pivoting from this because we saw that that process wasn't working. But our, you know, our first approach was not to worry about design or anything, just to figure out what's the quickest way that we can get this out there and see how users react. Um, when we pivoted to a consumer product, again, we had this exact same approach. Let's throw a box around it. Um, 3D printing can, can, can be a great method to prototype, but actually what we ended up finding out was doing simple things in, in the machine shop is faster than 3D printing. Like, this, that, the, the printed device on the, the left, I think took like, I don't know, 20, 30 hours, and the other device takes about four hours for a tech to make. So, you know, there's, there's new technologies are great, but you can be quick with old technologies as well. And we, we basically, we, again, we wrapped the technology in the box, we gave it out to users. And again, we, took, we, we basically took a middle road in terms of speed, and, and, and having a greater degree of rigor. Instead of just giving it out to users and trying to get a subjective response, just doing some user interviews, what we did was we went to a doctor who, was, uh, who had done a lot of clinical research, and we said, we don't have the money to fund a, clinical, a full double-blind clinical study, but can you take some of these clinical surveys that you're using in those studies and hack them to be short enough and simple enough that we can give, administer these as surveys to our users and get something that provides clinically relevant data without having us having to spend a lot of money on an IDRB approval. And you know, we were, we were really excited about this approach because it gave us a middle road. We were actually able to quantify when we gave this out to asthma and allergy sufferers how much symptoms declined over time. And when we, when we, were, when we took this data and we showed it to doctors, Doctors were also excited because now they, they, they saw a language that they can relate to. They're like, okay, wow, this is amazing to see this, you know, over a range of users for everybody to get this type of result is pretty unprecedented. Whereas if we told them, hey, we gave it to this person, and for example, Sandy, um, you know, she, the two months before she started using her device, she was going to the ER uh, pretty regularly, which was kind of scary. Um, since she had the device, she is not, we actually let her keep it because <laughs> she improved so much, but she's, she's not gone to the ER. Now, that's a great story. For us, that's really gratifying to hear. But for a medical professional, they're like, well, it's anecdotal. When, when you have some level of data around it, then it becomes a little bit more rigorous for them to understand. Um, one of the fundamental things where we ended up basically looking at where to go fast versus where to apply rigor was, does this impact our core value, or is this something peripheral? So, for example, you know, one of the first things we learned when we put those boxes out in people's houses is they don't like box designs. They want something that fits into their homes better. So we were looking at different designs and we needed a prototype airflow going through. Now, you can be extremely rigorous, do computational fluid dynamics, try to figure out how airflow goes in your device. We use you know, a foam core, paper, cardboard, and a fan. So, um, you know, we, we basically stuck all this in a lab, used some really simple sensors, and we were able to get a, a quick verification of things that you could spend forever on if you wanted to be as rigorous as possible. So, yeah, and finally after all that, we arrived at, this is the, the product that uh, Matt saw there at SolidCon, um, and hopefully you'll be, you'll be, you, you all will be seeing this product uh, sometime next year. And uh, we're really quite excited about it. I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have, you know, maybe a little bit more specific about uh, you know, rigor versus speed and when to make those trade-offs. Thanks very much.
also about your team. How, who do you need to build something like this? Um, so we actually went, we we're actually pretty, pretty lean on the team. Um, you know, we have basically myself. Uh, I, I'm actually not handling too much of an engineering role anymore, but back in those prototyping days, that, that was part of what I was doing. Uh, there's uh, Jaya, who's, uh, her background is me in mechanical engineering, uh, and, and she's, she's also a co-founder. She's working on the, the product side of things. Um, we have a, uh, we basically look for basically, every, each role should be really multi-purpose. Like, so people should be very multifunctional. For example, our CMO has a great background in design, industrial design. He really understands manufacturing, which is, you know, pretty, uh, uh, pretty out there for a CMO for, for CMO to know, but he's he's done startups in the past and he's manufactured products. Um, you know, when we looked for a mechanical engineer, we looked for somebody who basically, uh, we, and we hired another mechanical engineer. We looked for somebody basically who had not just the the experience in engineering, but also the experience in manufacturing, knowing how to bring things to market. So that's kind of how we we've grown the team. Right now, we're about uh, six people. Sure. Um, so we basically went through that selling process for, for the, that B2B selling process. And one of the things that we realized was while we were out there trying to sell that device, everybody wanted a device for themselves. And what we saw was, so I have asthma and allergies myself. That's one of my motivating factors behind this. And I talk to people every day and they're like, when can we get, some, get a device? And so what we ended up seeing was that there was probably a tremendous potential on the industrial side, it's still something we're gonna do, but there's much more pull from the consumer side. And the other thing is that with the consumer side, we can establish an outward facing brand that we can then take interior. So it's, some of it was like long-term long -term business strategy, and some of it was immediate, like we saw a ton of pull in the consumer market from people. Sure, um, so I mean, I think these are all things that we were trying to do very quickly, but basically what happened was when we saw things turning quickly, then we decided to take a little bit more rigor in diving into that consumer market. So when we, when we decided that, okay, we're gonna pivot to the consumer market, we spent a lot of time determining, you know, what is our actual value proposition to the consumer? Because making consumer sell is very different from a B2B sell where you can sell on you know, just simple features and, and cost and payback and these kinds of things. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. So, kind of development of the product, is it more of a um, technological, analytical aspect to new technology, to air quality, or is it more of a consumer marketing effort, like for air cleaners? No, the, the, we, we're, we fundamentally, uh, created a new technology uh, based, around, based around the use of light, electricity, and chemistry to break down pollution in air. Um, the, the technology that we have comes out of many, many years of fundamental research. And so, so, so that's kind of our fundamental sell. But one of the things that we realized was when you're making a consumer product, you can't just sell the science, right? People, are, people, people buy, a, buy a value system, they don't buy purely you know, science, right? And, uh, and you know, there's a lot of examples of companies that have had great technology and come, been first movers in a market and then lost it to people who understood the consumer better. And so that's, that's been a fundamental aspect of our development as we've changed. So it's fundamentally a technology play, but we've been very much prioritizing the consumer brand as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for us, long term, the, the vision is that this is something that should be ubiquitous, right? Like, if you think about here in New York, we've had uh, outbreaks of Legionnaires, right? Legionnaires is a very diff difficult disease to treat. And, uh, and, and this, can, this can completely break down those bacteria. Those bacteria were being spread through HVAC systems. So fundamentally, this is something that should be in every building. This is something that should be uh, in, in planes, for example, where um, 
you know, you know, where air quality is probably the worst and where we have the highest uh, chance of disease transmission. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, like the long-term vision is, is to go into all of those different things. Yeah. This is very exciting. Can you comment on whether you landscape the global IP uh, pre-existing art? So did you file for any global patents so that you can enter and scale up to global markets? And then the second question is, I know you, you bootstrap, but did you accept any private equity or VC, and what percentage of equity did you allocate for investments? Um, so, okay, so I'll answer your first question. Um, yeah, we, we have, um, so the way that we've approached IP is, and I think this is something that every entrepreneur should take into account, is that patents are a certain level of protection, but if you can, if you have something that's tough to figure out, a trade secret is better protection. So we've definitely we we've got uh, we we've got uh, patents that are, that are issued that are uh, that are worldwide patents. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think for everybody, you have to realize as a startup, you have a limited ability to go out and enforce patents internationally, right? Like if if we had disclosed everything in a patent and somebody in China had started read read the patent, figured out how to make it, and then started making it. For us, it's going to be impossible to go out there and stop them. If they're selling in China, maybe if they're selling in the U.S., then there's some possibility. But otherwise, it's not possible. So, um, so yeah, we, we took a blended approach. Um, I, think it's, I think it's really interesting. There's a lot of opportunities out there. So, so for us, we bootstrapped, and we took some, some federal money. So we, we've gotten some funding from the EPA, for example, through the SBIR program, and it's something that's really underutilized by entrepreneurs. They're, they're really hungry to get entrepreneurs who really understand commercialization really well. Right now, it's very technical focused. A, a lot of technical people are in there. Um, so, but it's a great program. They don't take any equity. They give you grants based on what they see the, the opportunity for disruption is. So, yeah. Cool. All right, so one last question. Okay. What is the consumer um, <clears throat> proposition? I remember at Brookstone, they had one that was ionization of the air. Yeah, for us, because we're able to destroy that complete gamut of indoor air pollutants from things like VOCs, which are carcinogens, to bacteria, um, we're actually able to move the needle on, on health fundamentally. So not just for people who are, who are asthma and allergy sufferers, but you know, if, you have, if you have, for example, mold in your home, or if you, have, like, if you bring in new furniture and there's some smell from it, you're getting a headache from that smell, we're able to completely destroy that whole range um, one of the problems with, unfortunately, uh, ionizers is that there have been multiple studies that have come out that shown that, they just, they, yeah, they don't work. Um, HEPA filters are actually great. They're really, really good at catching dust, um, but they don't work on the whole range. So I think right now, if you're in the market for an air purifier, you should definitely buy a HEPA air purifier. But there will be something, something new out there that can really move the needle on health that will be coming out next year. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. Thank you.